Some people say the metaverse will only be virtual. But one day in the metaverse, doctors will practice high-risk surgeries hundreds of times before they operate on real patients. And students will be transported to ancient Rome and Saturn's rings, improving health outcomes, learning, and more. The metaverse may be virtual, but the impact will be real. Learn more about what Meta is building for the metaverse at meta.com slash metaverse impact. Welcome, everybody, to the Untold Story podcast. I'm thrilled to be joined today by my friend and colleague, Trey Gowdy. He is the former House Oversight Committee chairman, Republican from South Carolina, House Intel Committee member, author of It Doesn't Hurt to Ask, which is a great book, and anchor of really one of our favorite shows on Fox, which is Sunday Night in America with Trey Gowdy, which we never miss. So, Trey, thank you very much for joining me today. You're going to make me cry. That that No one's ever said that many nice <laughs> things about me in a row before. Thank you. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. I really appreciate it. So we just want to share our conversation with our podcast listeners today. And there are a bunch of things going on right now. We're covering January 6th. We're looking into Hunter Biden because it looks like they're getting a little closer to making some kind of decision about whether or not to move forward with charging him. And a bunch of propositions from the president about executive orders he might make. So if I may, why don't we just kind of get your thoughts on this Hunter Biden story? Because I think you could shed some light on how these things work in general. They say they're getting closer to deciding whether or not to charge. What are you hearing and seeing out there on this today? Yeah, I mean, I think they're using the phraseology that it's reached a critical stage, which is really not the way prosecutors talk, but it may be the way that it's being covered. So I think the right way for your listeners to kind of process this is what is the conduct being investigated? And so you kind of segregate that out into different categories. There are allegations of lobbying or failure to register, uh, which you have to do in certain circumstances. There are firearm, both possession and application to purchase firearm allegations. There's tax evasion, there's influence, peddling, So each one of those, you know, there has to be a crime. There is no crime for just engaging in kind of a sketchy conduct. That that is not the title of any crime. You got to find the crime. And then you have to ask yourself, what is the evidence I have under each one of those crimes? And even if you have, you know, quote, evidence, Martha, it takes about 35 out of 100 on a scale you know, scale of one to 135 to, to make an arrest or get an indictment, it takes 95 to get a conviction. So I think what prosecutors, number one, you got to figure out what's your evidence, how good are your facts? And then number two, you have to process the likelihood of a successful prosecution. Because you and I have seen, even in the last couple of weeks, we've seen the Department of Justice swing and miss. Uh, Michael Sussman in the District of Columbia on a false statement. That was a really, really quick not guilty mm-hmm. verdict. That makes the department look terrible when they get a not guilty verdict and a quick one. The, the one that caught my attention the most, it is and has been for decades against the law for someone who is a, a user of controlled substances uh, to possess or purchase a firearm. Um, That has been the law um, probably, Martha, since you and I were born. The fact that Mm -hmm. we're like not familiar with that statute, that it's kind of a new one, is because it's almost never used. I mean, you stop and think how many people like marijuana is unlawful in some states. Are you going to possess everyone? You're going to prosecute everyone who has a firearm or applies to purchase a firearm that is a habitual user? A marijuana in states that it's it, there are almost no prosecutions under that. So you also have to factor that in too. He should not get any favorable treatment, no treatment that your listeners would not get. But he also should not be treated worse than the way your listeners should be treated. Understood. You know, there's some suggestion in the reporting that although they were looking at all the things on the list you just mentioned, that now it appears they're focusing on potential tax violations and gun violations as well. And I think a lot of people might look at that and say, and that's because they just want this to go away. The DOJ wants this to go away. They don't want to pursue the son of the sitting president. What would you say to that? 
Uh, they're probably right. Um, it's very hard for uh, it's hard to investigate and prosecute well-known people. Um, and that's not a defense of the system. That's just an acknowledgement of the reality of it. I mean, it's really hard for pro- because well-known people have have, a, have a, a, an army of great lawyers. It's hard to get a jury that hasn't, you know, that doesn't kind of confuse. Do I like the person or not like the person? It's just more difficult if the defendant is well-known. Tax issues are the way federal prosecutors get lots and lots and lots of defendants that they can't get on other conduct that they are suspicious of. So if he took money to do X and did not declare that as income um, in a lawful way, it's uh, it's kind of the Al Capone. I'm going to get you by whatever means mm-hmm. necessary. How are they going to mm-hmm. do influence peddling without interviewing the president? And no, the attorney general does not want to call the president of the United States and say, hey, I need to come interview you about your son's conduct. Mm -hmm. But I think the previous president was not keen on sitting down with investigators either. So I think the lady wears a blindfold for a reason. I think you ought to treat everybody the same, rich, poor, black, white, male, female. The tax I could see going forward, the firearm, I will be surprised. Martha, it's just that statute is rarely used. And I assume it's rarely used because it's hard to prove it. Interesting. I mean, it's just interesting in light of all these red flags that we've now seen suggest if someone is not in their right mind, they shouldn't be allowed to purchase a a weapon. So it would be interesting to see if there's a viable charge, given everything that we've seen on these videos on this laptop. I, I was doing like what all like washed up prosecutors do and focusing on what happens inside the grand jury room and inside the courtroom. And and you raise a much better point than any of that, which is the public perception of it. And you're right. That is exactly what I thought. All of this push for gun control, red flag laws, and your own child you know, arguably is like exhibit A and why we some states have them and other states are thinking about it. It puts the president in a terrible political position. But you know what else does? Martha, if you look at gun prosecutions, when Joe Biden was the vice president under President Obama, they went way down. So for this group that really, really wants new gun laws to go back and see, well, (laughs) this one applies to your family and the other gun laws you didn't enforce for eight years is a very bit bad Mm -hmm. political optic. We'll see where all of that goes. It sounds like we're going to get some information on it. It seems that people have been preparing for what we might hear out of the Justice Department. So we'll just leave that story for another day. Uh, We're also covering the January 6th hearing tonight. We expect it to be the last one, at least of this series. We're going to hear from Matthew Pottinger, who was a national security advisor, and also from a deputy press secretary, Sarah Matthews, about what happened during the three hours, roughly 187 minutes, I believe it is, when the Capitol was being broken into and what the president was doing at that time at the White House. So that's one part of the story. The other part is that they want to speak to Steve Bannon, and he's in the middle of a contempt trial at the moment. So your thoughts on what you're going to be listening to uh, as you watch all of this over the next several days and this hearing tonight, what do you think these hearings are set out to com- to accomplish, and do you think they've done that? Uh, well, I'm going to take them in reverse order. I, I think, you know, I hate to be cynical Um, And I don't know the motives of every member of Congress, but usually there's a political motive if Congress is doing it, which would be to enhance your position in the midterms or to weaken somebody politically. I think, ironically, what January 6th has done is hasn't laid a finger on the midterms. It may have weakened President Trump as a potential nominee in 2024, which doesn't make a lot of political sense because my guess is they'd rather run against him than run against someone else. So that's the irony of the politics of it. I probably was on air with you the first time, Martha, when I Mm -hmm. thought this, they would always have a hard time proving the incitement part of it. Because it's really not. I mean, if somebody listens to your podcast and decides to go like rob a bank, I mean, what is the connection between that? I mean, the fact that you're talking to people who are dumb enough to go storm the Capitol, can you prove that? Is that really the speaker's fault? I mean, Look, I got people in my life that tell me to do stuff all the time and I don't go do it. So that never made a lot of sense to me. What made a ton of sense to me was, okay, Mr. President, you did not incite the mob. That was not your intent. But once it happened, what was your reaction? 
And I was dumbfounded during the second impeachment. They didn't really go that to that element. They focused on the incitement. And now apparently tonight, they're going to focus on, okay, Mr. President, maybe you were as surprised as all of us that people dressed up like John Adams decided to crash the Capitol. But once you learned, what did you do? I'm going to be curious, number one, to hear mm-hmm. what the witnesses say. Number two, were they in a position to know it? Is it triple hearsay or are these eyewitnesses? Bannon, Martha is like a career offender when it comes to invoking executive privilege um, unadvisedly. Uh, He did it in front of a Republican investigative committee chaired by Devin Nunes, you know, who is hardly Adam Schiff. They they would be yin and yang. They would be opposites. But (laughs) a Republican committee wanted to talk to Steve Bannon, too. And Bannon, uh, for reasons only he can explain, has never met a reporter he wouldn't talk to off the record. He's never met a ghostwriter he wouldn't talk to while he's writing books. He's got a podcast. But yet when it comes to talking to members of Congress, even with a subpoena, he claims executive privilege. And unfortunately for him, it doesn't work that way. You, You don't get to go repeat conversations with the president to everyone in the world except members of Congress. So I, I think it's, you know, I don't know what a D.C. jury is going to do. The facts are not complicated. We'll see if there's any jury nullification that goes on. But the notion that you can be out of the White House talking to everyone in the world about what the president said to you and all of a sudden get laryngitis when Congress asks you, I, I just am going to be surprised if the jury falls for that. But at one point, Steve Bannon said he would come before the panel that there were certain circumstances that he wanted, but that didn't happen. Uh, He did. um, And that's called trial prep. Uh, That's when you know you're about to go in front of a jury and you don't have any legal defenses. Um, The president's lawyer is not backing your story that you were asked to invoke executive privilege. And uh, you really have no choice but to say, uh, "Okay, I was kidding about all of that other stuff. Now I'm ready to come and I want to do it in a public hearing. That was a PR stunt that was of absolutely no legal significance at all, which is why a judge said you can't even discuss that in court. The Untold Story continues right after this. Have you been dreading looking at your 401k or IRA account balance? I know I get an envelope in the mail every month. In good times, I don't like to look. In bad times, I dread looking. So you're not alone. And experts say there's no place to hide. But that is simply not true. The truth is you can build a financial bunker that grows and protects your money during even the scariest economic times. The Bank on Yourself Retirement Plan Alternative lets you escape the financial carnage and has never had a losing year in over 160 years. Whether you've been investing for years or you're just starting out, now is the time to bypass Wall Street and bank on yourself. Bank on Yourself lets you reach your financial goals and dreams without taking any unnecessary risks. You get guaranteed predictable growth and retirement income with no luck, skill, or guesswork needed. Unlike a government-controlled 401k, IRA, or similar plan, you control the money in your plan, not the government. You can use your money for any purpose with no questions asked without interrupting the growth of your savings. This is the strategy famous businesses like McDonald's have used when no banker would lend them a dime, and almost anyone can do it. You also have peace of mind, perhaps the best reason of all. You know the minimum guaranteed value of your plan on the day you plan to tap into it, and at every point along the way. You can get a free report with all the details of how adding bank on yourself to your financial plan can help you take back control of your money. Just go to bankonyourself.com slash untold. That's bankonyourself.com slash U-N-T-O-L-D, untold. So I want to ask you a little bit about midterms in South Carolina. Obviously, there's a very interesting Senate race there between Herschel Walker and the sitting Senator Warnock. What's your sense of that race and your sense of the midterms overall? And there's a number of things that sort of press on these races around the country about inflation, rising crime rates, general dissatisfaction with the president, according to his numbers. I think it is going to be a wipeout in the House. Um, I think um, some folks on the left were kind of hoping the Dobbs decision might blunt some of those losses. uh, And maybe it will at the extreme margins. But Kevin McCarthy is going to be, and I know he hates it when I say this, but you're asking me, so I'm going to tell you, he's going to be the Speaker of the House. Mm -hmm. The Senate, you know, the senators I talk to are a little bit worried 
you, you have to pick nominees that can actually win. And we saw in Delaware a couple of cycles ago, they decided to nominate someone that needed to go on television and remind us that she was not a witch. That's not probably a great use of your TV ad dollars. And then they nominated someone in Nevada, the only person in the state that couldn't beat Harry Reid. So Republicans nominated uh, the folks that can do the best statewide. These are not congressional districts with, you know, a couple hundred thousand people. These are Senate races. We'll see. You know, Herschel Walker, it's hard to run for the United States Senate if you've been in politics for 30 years. It's hard. I mean, the pitches come really quickly at that level. I think the consensus is uh, there needs to be you know, a little discipline, a little messenger discipline there. Uh, what's happening in, in, in Ohio and in Pennsylvania, uh, North Carolina is an open seat with, uh, with Senator Burr leaving. You know, Florida, Marco is a very, very talented, I don't want to say talented politician because that makes it, but, but you know, look, he, he, he's been, he's run for president. He, he, he knows what he's doing, but, uh, but Val Demings, it, it's very hard to, for folks to say Val Demings is soft on crime. Um, she was a former police chief. So I think the Senate is probably a jump ball right now, Martha. You brought up Pennsylvania. Looking at Pennsylvania, I noticed today that Nikki Haley came out in support of Dr. Oz. That is a tough race there. What's your take? Well, it was always going to be a tough race. I mean, there, there's a reason that, you know, Republicans sometimes struggle, not sometimes, Republicans struggle to win that in presidential years. Pat Toomey, you know, is not a member of the Freedom Caucus. You know, Pat, Pat Toomey is, you know, there, there, I'm sure there are elements within the Republican Party that, you know, would probably use the label rhino and attach that to Pat Toomey. I would not be one of them, but there are people that do that. Sometimes you have to do more to win a statewide race than you have to win in a narrowly gerrymandered House district. So, you know, I think Dr. Oz benefited from President Trump's endorsement. Well, I know he did. And I don't know that he's mentioned President Trump's name since he won the nomination. So that that's the little dance you have to do. You got to get nominated and then you got to realize, hey, I've got to appeal to other people without alienating my base, which is what makes it tough. And what and what Glenn Youngkin did in Virginia, speaking of statewide races, is, is really amazing. It comes down to, can, you know, what's going to happen in Missouri? I mean, are Republicans really, exactly. are they going to really nominate someone yeah. who had to resign the governorship? I think Missouri is a very interesting race. You've got a lot of people coming out to try to support these other candidates. Eric Reitens is the person that you referred to who had to resign the governorship. Now he wants to be a United States senator. Everything that you're saying just makes me think about the fact that we've talked all along about the Trump-supported candidates around the country, and we've seen a number of them succeed in primaries. But really, the question is, can they win in their general elections? And I wonder how that weighs on the former president's decision, who has said that the biggest factor he's thinking about right now is whether he should announce before or after the midterms. And I I think most people, you know, in his sphere would probably uh, recommend you know, if he's going to run in 2024 to do it after the midterms. I mean, you mentioned the things that are on people's minds right now, gas prices, inflation, watching their their savings and their retirement accounts dwindle, supply chain issues, uh, you know, a foreign policy that is really, really hard to make sense out of. So all of the crime, I mean, you, you got Democrat legislators that a year ago were not only talking about defunding the police, but they were talking about abolishing prison. So you have all of these things going for you, which is why you were projected to overwhelmingly win the House. Why in the world would you insert another variable into that? And it's got nothing to do with whether people like President Trump or don't like President Trump. It's got to do with just what is best for the immediate goal, which is to retake one of the chambers. Because if President Biden doesn't have the House and the Senate, sure enough, Republicans can't do anything they want to do, but they can stop lots of things they don't want done. So what is the argument for doing it now? I cannot, I cannot fathom the argument. If the president's going to run, why would he announce between now and the midterms and inject an issue that's not currently there and remove the focus from where it is right now? i Maybe I'm not smart enough to see it. I just I cannot fathom the argument for why that's a good idea. 
Last question goes back to January 6th and the hearings and the heat that minority leader Kevin McCarthy has received for deciding to pull Republicans from that committee after the people that they chose, Jim Banks and Jim Jordan, were rejected by Nancy Pelosi. Do you think that's well-founded criticism? Well, Martha, I'm going to do what I sometimes criticize the media for not doing. I'm going to confess my bias. He's been a friend from the day I met him, and he still is. And I probably don't have the objectivity that, well, I don't have the objectivity when it comes to Kevin. But I will say this. One of my favorite miniseries is called Outlander because they get to go back in time. I I love that show. They get to go back (laughs) in time. So let's go back to the day that Speaker Pelosi rejected Jimmy Jordan and Jim Banks. And I want you to imagine if Kevin said, okay, well, you didn't want those two. Let me replace them with, with two other folks. The right would have been outraged. They would have called him weak. They would have said, how dare you not fight for Jimmy Jordan? How, how at Jimmy Jordan, I have never heard criticized Kevin for the decision he made. Uh, and he is one of the more influential members of the house. So the criticism now is because there's a committee that is one-sided. There's no cross-examination. The flip side of that, but but I mean, you don't have to be a savant or a fortune teller to know that that was going to happen. So if Kevin had done what they now claim they wanted him to do, then they would have been mad at him then. They would have said he was weak, that he capitulated, that he's letting Nancy Pelosi drive the engine. So all of these people who are themselves unelectable when it comes to leadership positions in the House, they have all the great ideas. The hard thing is to make a call. I mean, I think Kevin would have very much liked to have had Republican representation. I'm not talking about Adam and Liz. I mean, I'm talking about people that that could cross witnesses, some ideological diversity, I think, on this issue. I think Kevin would have loved that. But imagine, Martha, if he had said, okay, I didn't get Jordan and Banks. Banks, by the way, is the head of the Republican Study Committee, if memory serves me correctly. So we're going we're gonna to mm-hmm. let you get rid of these two. We're going to let them keep Schiff, but, but I'm going to replace them. I mean, how many people can name the other three members that Kevin put forth? I mean, how many people even remember the other three names? And then if you're going to replace Jordan, who is seen as, I can, he's not just seen, I can tell you whether you like Jim Jordan or not. And I do like him as a person. No one prepares like Jimmy does. No one does. Radcliffe Mm -hmm. did, but he's gone. So who are you going to replace Jordan and Banks with? I mean, most people can't even name the three people that Kevin put forward. So who, who is the, like, the, the great trial lawyer, the great cross-examiner, the Perry Mason, the Clarence Darrow that you're going to replace Jimmy Jordan with. Who, who is it? What's the name of the person? Look, this is what happens when you're in, you're in leadership. You have to make a call. And then if it, if it turns out great, uh, other people take credit. And if it turns out poorly, then people blame you, which is why I never wanted to be in leadership and always felt sorry for the people that raised their hand and did it. I thank you so much for talking with us today. There's obviously a lot going on, and hopefully we can continue these conversations as we get deeper into the midterms. I know you're watching all of this very closely, and I'm going to let you get back to the work that you're doing at your law firm and also getting ready for your Sunday show, which we always look forward to seeing. Sunday night is a great show, and uh, we look forward to sharing that with you. And thank you so much for your time today, my friend, Trey Gowdy of South Carolina. Many thanks. You've been listening to The Untold Story. I'm Martha McCallum. Don't forget to subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. Make sure to rate and review. For more podcasts, go to foxnewspodcasts.com. From the Fox News Podcasts Network, subscribe and listen to the Trey Gowdy Podcast. Former federal prosecutor and four-term U.S. congressman from South Carolina brings you a -a one-of-a-kind podcast. Subscribe and listen now by going to foxnewspodcasts.com.